behalf of the John Adams Institute, welcome. Especially welcome in this room where some 350 years ago the contract was signed to construct Fort Amsterdam on Manhattan, which became later New York. The John Adams Institute, if you want to know more about it, is all in this folder. And we try to establish an American cultural center in this building, but without government subsidy, it's very hard, as you can imagine. We started two and a half years ago the American Literature Today series. We're very happy to introduce tonight Richard Powers. Welcome. Um, he and I, welcome uh, uh, tonight here. He and I had a very funny creative misunderstanding by <laughs> in our correspondence, because when, uh, when I asked him uh, uh, if, if he could stick his picture on our poster, he wrote back in Dutch, uh, please don't, don't stick my picture on your billetje, <laughs> by which he meant billetje, of course. <laughs> so I promise I will never, ever stick your picture on my billetje. <laughs> um, <laughs> if I can help it, of course. And um, welcome uh, Bas Heine. Bas is a well-known columnist <coughs> of English literature, English language literature. Uh, he will, tomorrow his uh, latest book will be presented and he will dedicate his time more to writing. He will introduce uh, Richard Powers this evening and uh, in about an hour there will be an intermission. After the break he will lead the discussion. Enjoy your evening. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my, uh, I won't take up much of your time because Richard Powers has told me that his speech is not very short. Um, <laughs> and it's always a uh, bother someone who, uh, if the someone who makes the introduction goes on for a long time. Uh, Richard Power is the author of three much acclaimed novels and I suppose some of you might actually have read, well, his most well known, his first novel, The Three Farmers on the Way to a Dance which uh, uh, was came out uh, in 1985 and has recently been translated into Dutch. Or perhaps his second a novel, uh, Prisoner's Dilemma, which is uh, more uh, harder to get by uh, in Holland, uh, published in 88. Uh, uh, or thirdly, his, uh, third, his third novel is The Goldberg Variations, which was highly praised on both sides of the Atlantic, especially in Holland, uh, uh, and America, of course, uh, when it appeared, and has just been nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award, as was, incidentally, was his first novel. Uh, a Dutch translation of this immensely uh, uh, fascinating and difficult book is being prepared and will be published next year, and I wish to translate it well, and I hope, <laughs> I hope he'll survive the job. Uh, uh, I won't even attempt to give a synopsis of these uh, brilliant, uh, endlessly fascinating and, for me, seemingly ever-expanding texts, uh, not only because it would take me at least an hour to uh, give the impression of all the diverse subjects which they encompass, uh, so you will only have the vaguest idea of what they're all about, but I suppose uh, most of you will have read them. And, but I won't do that because uh, you would only, I think, get a pale glimpse of the foundations on which these works rest, and that's the language, language in which they are written, which to me seems uh, totally original. Every novel, of course, stands on its own, but Richard Power seems to me uh, one of a handful of American writers who, by means of uh, language and form alone have su successfully managed to rearrange reality and made it into something uh, of their own. Critics looking for, compar for comparisons have often compared Power's verbal pyrotechnics to those of Thomas Pynchon, and in my opinion rightly so, but I think it would be a critical injustice uh, if the comparison would, would be stretched beyond stylistics. Each of his novels could, in his own way, be described as a quest, um, which in every case ends in a search for the nature and meaning of life itself. If those strike you as big words, uh, you should read the novels because they are big. And for me, the miracle of them is that the author manages to take on these enormous, overused and sometimes cliche-ridden themes and transform them in something new, 
in the sense that Ezra Pound meant when he exhorted the modernists to make it new. Each of Pound's main characters, you could say, is confronted with a multitude of questions, hints and clues. Uh, in other cases, they are literally given the bare facts. And each of them start out on a journey of discovery, which takes them to uncharted regions, whether the regions of time, as in three farmers, or the uh, regions of molecular, I hope I pronounce it right, science, as in the Goldberg variations. Though in Powers' novels reality is transformed, his work don't, st uh, don't stand outside life. On the contrary, the quest of his characters s seem to encompass on purpose every aspect of life, from what is what we primarily call high culture to low culture, um, from the secrets of DNA to the psyche of Mickey Mouse. Each and every quest, without exception, ends with a question mark, which seems even bigger than the one they started out, the character started out with. But the author leaves us in no doubt that in the end something has been gained uh, because of the simple fact that his characters have, are, were willing to undertake the quest at all. That is why I personally would call Richard Powers a writer who is an optimist or idealist in the true, and perhaps I should say in the American sense of the word. However, um, perhaps Mr. Powers uh, thinks this, <laughs> Richard Powers thinks this totally nonsense, but since this talk is all about cultural misinterpretation, I don't feel ashamed at all. Uh, <coughs> Richard Powers, who has spent a lot of time in the Netherlands, which I'm sure will be clear from his uh, speech or talk, will talk about these deep misunderstandings which exist between Dutch and American culture and if they can or if they should be overcome. I uh, ask your attention for Richard Pound. Thanks. Uh, boss used the word ever-expanding to describe my novels, and I'm afraid the same word can be used to describe this speech. Uh, it's going to run a little long, but uh, that means you get more for your money, and that's appreciated in every culture. So. He also assures me that uh, Dutch audiences are only aggressive toward Dutch writers, and that uh, to intruding foreigners you are pussycats, and always on your best behavior. However, having just prepared this talk on cross-cultural misunderstanding, I am aware that by good behavior, Boss and I may well mean different things. The letter inviting me to give this John Adams lecture declares, our program leads to an enhanced understanding of American culture, which as you may know, is greatly undervalued in Europe. On first reading that, I had to ask myself whether American culture really was undervalued in Europe, and whether it was less valued here than in other parts of the world, say North America, for instance. My being asked to speak in Amsterdam rather than in Washington or Los Angeles should disqualify me as an impartial judge. But let me speculate for a moment about the Euro European ambivalence toward the US for which the word undervalued sometimes seems euphemistic. I imagine a contest between my friends on either side of the Atlantic, a cutthroat, highbrow, trivial pursuit game that consists of identifying such icons of American culture as Jeroen Krabbe, Willem de Koning, Rutger Hauer, or Rip Van Winkle. I have no doubt which side in such a show of cultural appreciation would win. I further suspect, to extend this deranged thought experiment, that American culture is not the object of Dutch misappreciation. Rather, it's British colonial militarism that remains the source of deep and lasting resentment. Irritation that I'm not standing up in front of some Diedrich Knickerbocker Institute in London wearing a I Heart New Amsterdam t-shirt and buttering up the local underdog in Het Nederlands, which every Brit would have had to study for eight years in school out of sheer political necessity. <laughs> Any appraisal of cross-cultural appreciation or its opposite, whatever that is, would have to specify first the social stratum under question. I know that American literature is vastly better appreciated by Dutch intellectuals than is Dutch literature among their American counterparts. 
so much so that even this appreciation sometimes causes cultural crisis. You may remember a recent flurry in a uh, flurry about editorial policy at a leading arts weekly that shall remain nameless, but that I assure you was neat fout in the Orloch. <laughs> this flurry was touched off by a complaint about the space allotted by the book pages for domestic versus foreign book reviews, as if this country faced an artistic balance of payments crisis to match the fiscal one. The accusation was linked to another complaint that reviews were in general too laudatory, suggesting that we need to protect ourselves from liking a work too easily, especially a foreign work, one not invented here. Such a problem can only be addressed by a kind of safe sex approach to literature and to imported books, coupled with a chutkuring from the Rotterdam Duanas. <laughs> Yet my invitation from the Institute probably does not refer to the Dutch highbrow crowd so much as society at large when it laments the fate of American culture in this neck of the world's woods. This broader societal base, however, has been forced to miss my lecture tonight in order to stay home and catch Oprah. <laughs> All the same, I do wonder how Peoria actually plays among the more mainstream Dutch public. I did an informal tally of the 50 best-selling books in the Netherlands in 1991. By my count, one out of seven of these books on, the, on this list is American. The, the rest were all by Renata Rubinstein and Adrian van Dis. <laughs> Whether 14% is a large or a small number depends on which massive multinational holding group owns your publishing house. But the issue of quantity reveals less than the fact that these top 50 include, in spot number 37, although the book had only been out for a couple of weeks when the figures were compiled, that quintessential American product the sequel to Gone with the Wind, a set of character rights assigned to an entrepreneur cum novelist in public auction. I, th I think the book has done even better since then, if, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken. At this, at this point in, my, in any North American speech, it would be customary to issue the obligatory legal disclaimer. My ideas on the points to follow are only casually researched, entirely indefensible, and critically and scientifically uninformed. They are also invariably rejected out of hand by everyone I've ever tried them on in conversation. Everybody, without exception, has already formed firm, sweeping, and emotionally invested opinions about national identities, as if cadres of average Americans, Dorsne Nederlanders and, and the like, were loose in the world, bludgeoning about and threatening one another by their very existence, which, in a manner of speaking, I guess they are. I should also mention that this is my first and perhaps only attempt at public speaking. <laughs> and so I shamelessly intend to commit the novice novelist's mistake, which incidentally I also committed in my first novel, <laughs> of putting into it everything I might never get another chance to say. <laughs> I've learned in the papers that I'm a substitute for Allen Ginsberg, <laughs> who who at my age, during readings of his great poem, Howl, would reportedly reach the line about, America, when are you going to take off your clothes? And would promptly proceed to do so. I briefly considered giving you such a working demo of the differences between our two worlds. But instead, let me restrict myself to the intellectual failings I've just mentioned. I come, after all, from a country that will not permit a bare breast on television but whose citizens will tell perfect strangers on trains excruciating details about the grueling divorce they've just gone through. A couple of years ago, on my first trip to the Netherlands, I found myself on a cold, gray, rainy winter evening. It's a setting that has since become almost archetypal. <laughs> Standing outside St. Jan's Cathedral in Serchtenbos, indulging what a friend of mine in the South calls my typical American tourist's obsessional fetish with old stones. <laughs> Actually, I had spent the day at the now defunct Evoluan in Eindhoven, indulging that other typical American obsession, the dire hope that cold fusion, biochips, or some other miracle discovery is about to rescue us cavalry style just before the end of the fifth reel from all our other discoveries. The old stones compulsion is probably contritional, while my country does indeed possess buildings dating back into prehistory, 
a fact not widely appreciated by Europeans or many Americans for that matter. All our oldest stones are saddled with a tremendous sense of guilt. Whatever the reason, I was doing my enthusiastic walking tour of the outside of the cathedral when a local woman stopped and looked up to see what I might be looking at. This woman had on the day glow face paint, clown suit, and polychrome parrot plumage that the Baydeckers failed to prepare you for in their description of the sedate and sober natives. Finding me staring up toward the Gothic clerestory in the dark, she stopped and followed my line of sight, perhaps thinking that some of her fellow drunken carnival viewers had climbed up onto the buttresses and begun celebrating their way up to heaven. Which, for those of you who have ever had a good look at the cathedral, they actually have. In a mengsel language that didn't correspond to anything I had come across in my Dutch Berlitz tapes, which I'd acquired at a B. Dalton's in a shopping mall in Illinois, she proceeded to ask just what the hell I was staring at in the middle of the night. I gave her my two sentences, which at that time consisted of pleased to meet you and is this the way to the American embassy? <laughs> As soon as she discovered my nationality, everything became clear, and my bizarre ritual was explained. A look of knowing pity crossed her face, and she said, of course, you're an American. You have no culture, do you? <laughs> now, it's true that my explicator was in the throes of day four of the great annual holiday of those parts of the land that lie too near the Romance countries. But half of you fish-nosed northerners right now shaking your head and muttering zielige Brabanters may be surprised at how often an American in this country must bite his lip and grin grimly as people forgivingly let him off with that polite truism. The non-existence of an American intellectual or artistic class is so widely assumed throughout northern Europe that my claiming to be an American novelist has sometimes been received with the gentle skepticism that Dr. Johnson reserved for women preachers, whom he compared to a dog walking on its hind legs, finding it remarkable not because it's done well, but because it's done at all. <laughs> In fact, it was a Dutch intellectual, teacher, and art impresario who first told me the joke about the difference between America and a carton of yogurt. The yogurt has culture. <laughs> I later invested much effort and time helping spread the joke in North America, where it has caught on quite well, <laughs> nurtured by the secret urge for self-punishment that hides behind the state's propensity for flag-waving. For in my heart of hearts, I believe that the rampant boosterism bordering on solipsism that infects my culture is a compensatory sense of inferiority. Perhaps exactly this schizoid mix of megalomania and nervous inadequacy is what makes the U.S. such an object of lurid fascination for many Netherlanders, the country they love to hate, a country in its wild oversteering between smugness and self-loathing, too close to home for comfort. At first glance, the two cultures that the Adams Institute admirably tries to bridge seem too too incommensurate to mention in the same subordinate clause. How can a citizen of a place where high school children are forced to watch commercials as part of their daily dose of classroom TV possibly hope to communicate with citizens of a country where the day's raging debate is whether to let the store stay open past six o'clock? <laughs> Even the languages with which these two pursue their respective advertising reveal opposite ways of constructing the link between the self and the outside. Two takes that could not be more mutually unintelligible if they tried. In one corner, the beer-bellied, street-brawling, illiterate but ultimately lovable thug, high-fiving you and slobberingly insisting that you be all you can be and reach for all the gusto you can get. In the other corner, the impeccably, albeit militantly casually dressed, stay-at-home xenophobic federalist knowingly and always with distancing irony asserting, do maar gewoon, dan doe je gek genoeg. <laughs> Recall that the Hema, which I can now find blindfolded in any town in the Netherlands, <laughs> has as its motto, de normaalste zaak van de wereld. A proverbial sales pitch that knows how nothing is more comforting to a native 
than the idea of doing the most ordinary thing in the world at the most ordinary store in the world. What I'm describing is not the gulf between Dutch and North American culture, however that might be located in psychic space. It is the difference between a state that has fully embraced the maelstrom of transnational commercial annihilation, where an individual life is measured exclusively by its ability to wreak consumptive havoc, and a state that has tried to back slowly into the vortex while preserving its ancient protective coloration. Despite holding a passport from a place where 7 million phone sales pitches are conducted by computer every day, a country whose supreme contribution to world art, the commercial film, now carries paid advertisements within the narrative, a reported 19 paid ads in the film Die Hard 2, I am still frequently shocked by Dutch advertising's suppleness at upping the game's ante. Who, for instance, would be so unwise as to try to deconstruct let alone touch, Vroomen Dreesman's recent Echte Mannen Drage Ballen. I mean, really, <laughs> someone will have to explain this to me. <laughs> Alongside that one, for more profound indecency, one might place the ad for one of the country's most respectable newspapers, that full-page color picture of the starving African child with caption, Kind of Hironama, child or charity account, or to state the unspoken third choice, advertisement. The newspaper, the caption says, is for those who seek the nuances. This poster strikes me as a kind of hyper-eloquent one-upsmanship of that American invention, the advertorial, in which product plug masquerades as urgent news. And here it reaches its epitome, news disguised as news, when it is, in fact, just another commodity, merchandising by means of the planet's most obscene pain. There are those who would point to such sledgehammer innuendos as further instances of the Americanization, read degradation, of everything that once held Dutch society together. But these examples surpass, in my mind, anything that might fly in the States. I believe that America is not the evil originator of the new transnational culture, the apotheosis of the quick cell, but certain aspects of its society, its multicultural background, its once unlimited frontier, and paradoxically its origin in Puritan and even Calvinist work-intensive sobriety, have left it the most vulnerable to defining all values in terms of their market viability. Imagine a sort of doctrine of the elect, where the signs of God's election are reflected in rampant material prosperity in this world. I'm asking you to view the familiar transatlantic dichotomy not as marauder trampling on victim, but as two distinct cultures with a common, if increasingly divergent, history, struggling with varying degrees of failure to straddle a rift pitting forgotten past against unwelcome future. The interpretation that sees America as chief neo-colonial exporter of consumerist imperialism fails to see how much of my country's culture Gershwin, Ives, Hawthorne, Dickinson, all those Adams fellows, is savaged by the triumph of the international culture of commercial eternal youth. Even given this view of contemporary history, it remains unclear whether our two cultures have anything to give one another but garbled disinformation. Witness the little white, tow-headed Dutch kids on the stair rapping about drink mix co-opting a musical idiom that began in the death camps of Watts in the South Bronx as desperate antinomian sass against a system that eats the children of American cities alive. Rap's desperation, its roots in life-annihilating poverty, its black outsiderness, are beyond the experience of all but a very few of this country's young, who, if nothing else, probably have even more trouble than I do in picking out the words. All that possibly can be audible to some 12-year-old in her 17th century Achterhuis trying to follow along with Brand Nubian would be the residue of violent, resentful, and sexy rhythm after the form has been husked by the skilled exploiters of world video networks. The motives and means, the headlong race toward terminal escapism by a society whose second largest grossing export is entertainment, must be utterly inscrutable out of its historical context. 
hopelessly lost on the Dutch kids who sport sweatshirts with logos of non-existent sports teams, the Denver Mustangs, the New York Minutemen, and the like. <laughs> and yet, what Stanley Elkin only dares to write about as grotesque black parody, Henny Huysman turns into television. You may have caught his New, Year, New Year's Eve special, where a 27-year-old Dutch man was reunited with, his, with the father he had never seen, while the nation looked on in prurient fascination. The father was, appropriately enough, American, although this is still probably not the kind of cultural bridge that the Institute has in mind. <laughs> that our countries are gradually, like it or not, assuming at least the outward trappings of a common culture is not surprising. For isn't it the great, seductive, straight-jacketing lie of rampant consumerism that you are unlike all of the other five billion people whose business we also want, and that we, all 20,000 of our interchangeable franchises, are quite unlike any other mass retail chain in knowing just how to serve you. No matter where you live or what grammar lies buried deep in your native speaking brain, such a pronouncement will come in time to seem, as the saying goes, the most normal business in the world. Everything in this cynical non-aggression pact between foreign and domestic, every human meaning that we might, as refreshing and unprecedented strangers, still awaken in one another, is lost in translation. The insidious self-perpetuating forces that manipulate all that you will ever know of North America are, I think, a flip side to that split that has, in recent history, infected every country on the planet. I mean the disintegration of every culture into fragments, one costume to live in, one to archive and to curate, one for dress-up days, one with embroidered name-brand logo to sport in the all-embracing marketplace. If it has become impossible to keep the separate parts of our own cultural identities conversing in anything short of schizophrenic disassociation, then what hope is there that we can converse across the gap between two such sick cultures? I've lost track of the number of times that people here have asked me, oh, you're an American? You must know that great writer Karl May. Well, it's a sign of my cultural insularity that I, like everyone else in America, educated or not, had never heard of the guy until coming to Europe, although the Britannica insists he is one of the best-selling fiction writers of all time. Any of you Nederlanders who have visited the States may well have been cornered there by someone who wanted your expert opinion on Hans Brinker and the Silver Skates, a book no one here has ever heard of, but which has been for countless American children their sole connection with Holland, as the mythical place is always called. The Britannica does not say whether Mai ever touched foot in America or saw an Indian. It doesn't matter. I am moved by the image of millions of European kids coming to know all about America through a writer who no one in America has ever heard of. <laughs> children who, as a friend reports having done in his own childhood, ride through their Wonweka on stick horses, shouting things like all recht to one another, considering it the height, the quintessence of wild Americana. No international aerogram arrives without garbling. Another friend here reports that when she was a little girl growing up in Brabant, her father told her that if she ever got lost in the woods, to keep walking in a straight line until she got out. Now, how can anyone who grows up thinking that all woods can be walked through ever read Cooper, or Twain, or Thoreau, or Richard Wright, for that matter? You might counter by asking how someone who grew up in Chicago could know anything about the frontier. I try not to confess to the Chicago bit, by the way, because it invariably causes Dutchmen to point their fingers at me and make machine gun noises. <laughs> But you must believe me when I say that every kid in my suburban neighborhood grew up convinced that one could still live like Davy Crockett or Daniel Boone in the forest preserve just west of O'Hare Airport. <laughs> 
The fact that those two names may mean nothing to a kid from Breda who knows all Karl May's savages by heart only proves my point. The unbridgeable barrier of garble has little to do with language. If anything, the cross-purposes loggerhead between the U.S. and the Netherlands is even thicker between England and the U.S., those two countries divided by a common tongue. Imagine my surprise on coming to this country to learn that I didn't speak English at all, but rather a bastard mongrel dialect with its own put-down name. This judgment, of course, is leveled by a linguistic group whose chief dictionary distinguishes between A-B-E-N, that is general, general civilized Dutch, and A-Z-N, general southern Dutch. But as for the Brits, my first book was reviewed in a leading English newspaper, one of those studies in compaction where the reviewer covers six books in 200 words. This time, the books had as their common denominator the fact that they were all Americans. <laughs> of course. And the reviewer spent half of his 200 words wondering why anyone on either side of the Atlantic would bother with this stuff. Another English reviewer accused me of succumbing to, the, I quote here, the dire influence of Herman Melville, which would be the cultural equivalent of a Flemish reviewer accusing a Dutch writer of failing to escape the awful impact of Multatuli. <laughs> this reviewer was probably still chuckling at England having gotten Hank James and Tommy Elliott for an undisclosed amount of cash and a minor leaguer to be named later. <laughs> the problem here is America's is the American fiction's fascination with what critic Tom LeClaire calls the art of excess, and Edward Mendelssohn describes as the urge to compile the comprehensive encyclopedia. I believe the local term is dicapillin. Barth, Pinchon, Gaddis, Mailer, <laughs> 1,300 pages, and the last line is to be continued. <laughs> All of these guys tend toward a sheer anarchic polysprawl that word processing will likely bring to a Borgesian culmination. In other words, until, recent, in, in other, until recently less heterogeneous nations on the earth, taste demands that erudition and ambition, if they must exist at all, be tucked away like an embarrassing catheter or a colostomy bag. Such DeMille-like overproduction is showing off, not good form as Captain Hook says. There is something in the English response to contemporary American fiction that reminds me of the psychic horror of Limburgers when plunged into the architectural chaos just across the Belgian border, and their infinite relief upon turning back, even if the sign reads, Pay Ba. Yet repugnance can sometimes be matched by an equally bewildered fascination. For example, the incredible thrall in which Twin Peaks holds the European intelligentsia. Now, what is it that entrances Hollanders, whose favorite domestic visual image is the cinema verite door being closed on a nos camera on the evening news? I mean, really, have you ever noticed how many times you see a door closing? About something so unrepentedly American as David Lynch's gratuitous pursuit of strange novelty by an eternal innocence that is not corrupted so much as it is exhausted. My suspicion is that reading an Elkin or watching a Lynch or a Spike Lee is a little like tuning into one of those delayed broadcast baseball games on Sportnet, where the voiceover delivers a perfect translation of the original, right down to a present tense rendering of last week's weather in Atlanta or Seattle. The verbatim play by play with everything changed. Or I might compare it to turn the tables to trying to grasp the essence of Gezelligheid by studying Vermeer's Concert, where it hid out, until its recent theft, in a fake Italian villa not two miles from where Emerson turned into a transparent eyeball while walking across Boston Common. The first-hand knowledge that we would need in order to cross this cultural barrier is available only to the native speaker. Anyone who has ever left home knows how we are forever doomed to bump up against one another on the world's overcrowded station platforms, mere stereotypes of our public selves. The American ambassador of goodwill, who wears a baseball cap even on being elected to high office, who must burn the flag if it touches the ground, who cannot find Canada on a map, 
who drives to the health club where he treats himself to a frozen tofu, (laughs) who surgically removes his excess fat every few months to no lasting effect, whose only book read this year was Learning to Love Your Dysfunction, (laughs) who believes that a European who refuses to speak English is just being perverse, (laughs) attempting to exchange dollars for Hilden's on a sliding scale with the Amtenar, who takes out six supplementary insurances, throws a 10-kilo sack of potatoes in the trunk for a two-week trip to Costa del Sol, who started to listen to the Avondon on the radio but was interrupted by friends dropping in for coffee, who drives to the health club where he treats himself to a pills, <laughs> and who can say Verschrikkelijk Leuk in half a dozen different languages. There seems no prospect for anything but eternal, aggravating misunderstanding between these two. They will be kept apart forever by the publishers of a faulty phrase book that is culturally prejudiced at best and at worst, capricious. I put it to you that this is cause for great artistic optimism. American optimism, perhaps. A work of art signifies by setting up expectations and responses, tensions tensions and relaxations, satisfactions and denials that depend for their meaning on the entire context these expectations bounce off of. When that reflective context is changed, everything that the work means changes. And only through the process of depriving a work of its cultural familiarity does the potential for creative misunderstanding arrive. Dislocation is the only way that creative artifice can come to mean more than it did originally, changing the misunderstander irreversibly in the bargain. You may know Marquez's explanation of how he came to his magical realism, thereby changing world literature. As a boy in Colombia, a country named for an Italian in the pay of Spain who mistook Cuba for Japan and the mouth of the Orinoco for one of the rivers of paradise, Marquez took the medieval Arabic oral tales of the Thousand and One Nights to be straight journalistic accounts of events in foreign countries. This was before our own international fantasy reports in the form of CNN. (laughs) Transplanting this colossal misunderstanding to the place he knew, and thereby doubly overhauling the medieval Arabic, he created something unprecedented, a literature of wildest unlikelihood, wedded to absolute, everyday matter of fact. A later, equally miscalculated discovery of the way magic might be made real allowed Toni Morrison to find, in a South American jungle village she could not possibly have understood, one source for her own endlessly original invention. Now, what might be done with Morrison in a country that cannot possibly understand slavery, except perhaps in its ancient role as wholesalers, remains to be seen. Another example, one that may be less known here than it is in North America. Just before the middle of the last century, a 40-year-old American writer died of basic hard living. That's how a lot of them go down. The reputation he left behind in his own country was at best modest, that of a feverishly romantic rhymester, half insane and wholly macabre. Two of his leading contemporaries dismissed him with now famous put-downs as the jingle man and two-fifths sheer fudge. In short, a backward-looking, gothic figure with no lasting literary legacy. Then you Europeans got him. After his death, he was translated wildly and inaccurately by Baudelaire and others. His influence on European writers ranging from Jules Verne and Conan Doyle to Dostoevsky, Verlaine, Mallarmé, make him not just the begetter of science fiction and the detective story, but a godparent of modernism. Only after his writing worked its way back to America through countless foreign influences was Poe reappraised and appreciated for the first time in his own country and ultimately admitted 
to the canon of his native land's great writers. Canon formation, as you may know, is an explosive topic in the States right now as the victoriously apologetic society proclaims its successful drive on world assimilation by stumbling toward an after-the-fact confession of interculturality. But even progressive attempts to expand the canon can be enlightened tyranny, obeying an edict that, because prescriptive, is often as constricting as the canon itself. Canons, the history of culture repeatedly insists, are meant to be busted, and busted repeatedly as part of their lone negative legacy. And the way they are broken, the history of art also insists, is by one group of practitioners willfully or well-meaningly failing to assimilate the inheritance left them by another. This productive corruption of connotation has a few distinct sources. The first is a sort of basic historical ignorance. Well, one could make the claim that the entire Renaissance was based on a bastardized understanding of what classical culture was really about. Of course, such a judgment depends on the belief that we now know what classicism is. More frequently, though, historical naivete is personal, intimate, like Mendelssohn finding in Bach the first romantic, or Rousseau's bizarre proclamation that he was the greatest living painter in the modern style and Picasso in the Egyptian. The man hadn't a clue as to what he was talking about, for which we can only be grateful. What Hughes calls the shock of the new can also arrive, can also arise from a simple lack of familiarity with stylistic convention. A Czech DP working in New York in a small town in Iowa that must have seemed like the far side of Mars driven by his false discovery of what he thought was a common thread linking Indian and Negro music, and inspired by a Czech translation of that mad American pseudo-Indian epic Hiawatha, could produce a symphony that would move generations of Swedish-Irish Chicagoans to tears as the supreme American work of the 19th century, one still called the New World Symphony. The celebrated theme from Dvorak's second movement, an imitation of an American spiritual, is now universally mistaken for one by Americans and foreigners alike. Another Czech emigre living in Canada would write a novel based on this composer's life, which, when translated back into northern European languages, continues to propagate this fecund cross-fertilization of the half-comprehended. The lost particulars of situation an incident, also father productive misreading. The book that had ha has had the greatest impact on fiction in this century would seem very different to us, I'm sure, if we recognized all of those Dublin Dorpsfiguren for who they really are, rather than the library-sized reader's guides they have become. Half of our core classics are Romana clay, for which the clay is forever lost, like some golden age still life, continuously working its impact right up to the present on both viewers and painters who have long ago shed the ability to read the original symbolic language of the canvas. Situational shifts, broken contexts in which we receive our imported art messages from the outside, no matter how they damage the original significance of a work, if one can even talk about such a thing, frequently add to it. The famous Albinoni Adagio, the manuscript discovered in Dresden and reconstructed after the firebombing, now has a devastation attached to it beyond all power of the genteel Italian Baroque composer to imagine. Subtler than these sources of creative misunderstanding is the failure to properly read a work's register. Irony and metaphor can be entirely misconstrued by those lacking the clues on which register depends. The topical specificity of much current American art, references to brand names and slogans and proper names, will cause a writer like Nicholson Baker, with his inspired von Leeuwenhoekian endlessly expansive examination of roach motels and jiffy pop, real products 
that you simply cannot accredit unless you've grown up with. Will make these things come across as an abs- will make Baker come across as an absurdist, when he is, in his original language, more of a brilliant minister at the apotheosis of things ordinarily too ordinary for words. I can only speculate as to the treasures readers might find in him in a country where the word chemein takes up an entire column in the Vandala. Register is the slipperiest of artistic commodities even in one's own idiom. Frank von Dixhorn, the translator of my first book, tells me that on a car trip through the American South, it took only a couple of conversations at gas stations along the route to realize that this Faulkner fellow was not a wildly imaginative allegorist at all, but if anything, a kind of (laughs) photo-naturalist. Let me report my own reverse experience at my very first Konechinedach, on hearing the local monochord at the Stadthuis proceed from a paean to the Queen and a four-part rendition of Wilhelmus, which is incidentally the greatest national anthem in the world, King of Spain notwithstanding, to a fierce hymn of Limburg separatism and a deadpan rendition of Old Black Joe. If we mean anything at all by the word culture, we must mean an imaginary... This is why Poe's story is not the exception, but the norm. Something much more than the prophet without honor in his own country syndrome. It is why Hesse and Mann were for a long time vastly more appreciated in America than they were in Germany. And why Germany continues to appreciate Thomas Wolfe much more than he is appreciated in the States. It's why Robert Burns, of all regionalists, is lionized in China although God knows how the words gang after a glay get translated into ideograms. It is why Zimbabwe's biggest grocers include Dolly Parton. It is why Nabokov's Penin falls into dismay in an American bookstore when he cannot find the work of America's greatest writer. He says, in Russia I remember everybody, little children, full-grown people, doctors, advocates, everybody read and reread him. The writer in question is Jack London, a sad joke in American literary circles. But the joke is on the Americans, who fail to see what is obvious to outsiders. London, the adventurer, wilderness's tempter and survivor, the first beat, grandfather to Kerouac, great-grandfather to Ginsburg, to whom I owe my appearance here today. George Steiner shows that every translation is a change not only of the source text, but of the target language. I think of the English rendition of Proust, now in its third stage of what will doubtless be perpetual revision. The target language, as a result of this ongoing multi-person project, has been injected with the inescapable trace residue of that musical syntax haunting the brains of its working translators. If you've ever translated, you know it is impossible to think, even in your mother tongue, the same way you would if you weren't at that moment submerged in another language. The resultant music is neither Proust's nor French, an amorphous category at best, nor, until that moment, English. It is quite literally unprecedented, grounded in an inaccurate porting over of a work across a threshold that renders all translation inaccurate and unprecedented. Cross-fertilizing inaccuracy, once set in motion, wafts back and forth in both directions over the cultural barrier. In the 40s, in a synthetic town on the west coast of the US, a number of European emigres, nowadays they'd be in court trying to prove they were political and not economic refugees, worked diligently at producing B-genre movies in what they thought was a genuinely American idiom. These films, dismissed as potboilers in the American marketplace, gradually began grabbing the attention of a later generation of European moviegoers, raised on Hollywood's cast-offs, who discovered in the genre a dark cynicism that by the time it returned to influence the American industry as a new and unrecognizable product, 
had earned its own name, film noir. What would it even mean for the Dutch to appreciate American culture? I don't know. I suppose appreciation would consist of some sense of why American artwork presents special difficulties in porting over. It's outrageous, anarchical heterogeneity. It's ironic self-consciousness, born in a mix of inferiority and aggressive diffidence. It's range. Current American serious fiction maps a gap between a Mark Halperin and a William Volman, just kind of Manichaean spread, as large as the country of impossible epitomies. Appreciation of the stateside novel would require some glimpse of the huge split in American life between bookstore and special order fiction, between production line writing and overly mediated postmodernism, with the immense, untranslatable corpus of what publishers cruelly call the mid-list falling away in between. From abroad, the gap between what a foreign fiction says and what it means must always be decoded in the absence of the references that fiction uses as leverage. And yet, the same is true of every text you come across, not least of all the ones that seem closest to native idiom. All reading is translation, even, maybe even especially in your own language. Perhaps it is not culture we ought to be appreciating at all, but the individual, always surreptitious work. Culture is a mock-up, a set of guidelines meant to increase the illusion of security and stability in social exchange. It is exclusionary in nature, normative and curatorial, a private club drawn up for rapid identification and expulsion of the non-member. To read, on the other hand, is to live as temporary illegal alien in another country. Literature in the largest sense is a moratorium on the one life we think we know everything about. It pitches us into circumstances that resist assimilation, even on the grounds of their very familiarity. The cultures we live in disguise an urgency that can only be seen, only addressed by returning to it after time spent abroad in the foreign text. The point then of better appreciating American culture is not an idle exercise in co-option or kissing up to the international imperialists. It is an invitation to creatively misunderstand a chance to step temporarily out of the constraints of culture and to see the place as a stranger might. Incomprehensible otherness is a way of coming back, returning, in that traitor Eliot's cryptic words, to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. In my book, The Goldbug Variations, the narrator makes a startling discovery that I stole from several different, perhaps misunderstood, scientific texts. That we, individual humans, differ more from one another than mankind as a whole differs from the next nearest species. Surely I differ from, say, Bas, more profoundly than Americans differ from Dutchmen. Whether this means, as so much of literature seems to assert, that each of us is finally alone, or whether it becomes an unending source of discovery for the raw, awful specificity and weight of the world, remains, as it must, a question of individual temperament, as passed through the statistical filter of cultural bias. To tip that bias, we have art's useful intervention, like the student of a foreign language who discovers in a dead etymology a root that the native speaker no longer hears. The reader of a foreign text can find again in art that most valuable strangeness, one that does not conform but subverts the presuppositions that hem in the private sensibility 
in whose name cultural norms are claimed. When all context changes, the moment of reading can remain radical, exploding categories even as it measures them, and even recognition can come as a shock to be felt again in that smallest society of one, whether it be in Manhattan Project, or Golden Age Colonial Mansion, or alongst the Lange Lindelon, in whatever country of origin happens to be stamped upon your passport. And the point of travel, whether you move in relation to the thing, or the thing moves out from underneath you, is not just to play the eccentric foreigner in his fetishistic misappreciation of someone else's old stones, but to turn around, to follow the outsider's view onto your own too familiar building, and see your countrymen there, mistakenly celebrating their way up the buttresses toward that most distant of roofs, to have a good look, and even perhaps, if, on, if only temporarily, to know the place for once, to come home. Thanks. has questions um, that he would like to pass out to everyone for them to ask. <laughs> That's after we pass the hat for the, for the Adams Foundation. <laughs> Thanks very much for this. It's a wonderful opportunity. It is a not-for-profit organization, and uh, I will show my cultural difference here by uh, <laughs> giving a plug. Well, I'm, I'm sure uh, there will be some questions that... So people are burning to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let, let me start first then, and uh, feel free to... Oh, 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 oh. yeah, there's... <laughs> the lady in the back. <laughs> It's a good question, isn't it? That's a very good question. Um, I, w I think I would disagree with the with the with your formulation of the, of the of the final final thrust of the speech. It's it's difficult because I'm not saying you will never be able to understand it. I'm simply saying you will never be able to understand it in the way that that someone who has that cultural context would understand it but that doesn't mean that you won't understand it with at least an equal richness and perhaps even greater richness. Now, that may not actually be saying that much because the fact is no one has the same cultural context as the author. And in fact, the, 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 the attempt to gain that object, objective accountability is in some ways always going to be frustrated because you cannot read the book the way that the author wrote the book. And that's why I make the point all reading is translation, especially reading in your own language. So... Not all reading is translation. What nonsense is that? Whoa. <laughs> now, we're, now we're getting started here. Not all reading is translation. Far more not all reading is translated. Sir, I agree with Well, all right. Well, let, let me answer it. Yeah, I, I, um, I would say that um, we may be equivocating on terms, but let me, try to, let me try to sell you what I mean by the word translation. I mean by translation something more than the change of one language group into another language group. 
I'm sorry to interrupt you again. Yeah. I should specify I'm a translator. Yes. So that's why I say that not all reading is translated. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now you go again, please. I don't know what you're uh, like. Right Thanks. <laughs> Good to know. But the second, well, then this, I think the second part of, of your question will be very interesting, uh, in the sense that should you read your book in English or in Dutch? Then you well, will it's, it's related to, to, to uh, uh, what we're ultimately talking about when we're talking about the phenomenon of translation. Um, I, I, would re I would refer, if you're interested in this question, and it's a very open-ended and difficult uh, uh, and, and, and uh, really merits a lot of hard thinking, not, not quick thinking, but hard thinking, I would refer you to, to the Steiner book, After Babel, which I think is a brilliant exposition of this idea that uh, every act of interpretation requires translation of historical context, of cultural, cultural uh, uh, symbols, of uh, um, signs and signifiers, what the you know what the what uh, the, the theorists like to do, but it's done in the moment of reading. Now, I, I think if you want to, to hold me accountable to a distinction between the 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 process that a translator is involved in when they when they literally move a text from one language to another, and what a reader does when they move the text from the page into their own emotional context, then I would say yes. You need to make a distinction between those two things. But allow me to use the word figuratively. I don't think I don't. I think that the what's gained by using the word figuratively is greater than what may be lost by um, using it in a metaphorical sense. This once. Now, as as for the uh, the second half of the question, I happen to know that the translation is very good, but I think it would also depend on your language skill, and I think that um, uh, it's it's interesting because the first book actually has as its theme this idea of the original print and whether such a thing exists. And it's a sort of el elaborate uh, uh, structural metaphor even that builds up this idea that the, that the print is always a collaboration between the audience, the subject, and the photographer, the author. And that in a way, what you're looking for in any act of reading is this it, it, my, my metaphor would be the um, stereoscope. You know, there's two images next to each other, which one, one is not quite the other image, and yet through the viewer, they, they, they become a three-dimensional image. And in one sense, a translated text gives you a wonderful opportunity of raising that stereoscopic effect even another level and actually doing a side-by-side -side reading, which would be my recommendation. <laughs> Then I make money on the American copy and the Dutch translation. Here you are again. Yes, there you are again. All right. Sorry? I know, I know your, 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 your Dutch is pretty good. But no, it's really not that good. What's that? No, I, really my Dutch is not that good and I can't translate. I did not do the translation. No, but I know your, your, your Dutch is pretty good. Uh, but did you really uh, have you existed as a translator? No, I'm not talking about translating, but have you ever existed as a translator? Made a living as a translator? No, I have not. Yeah. No, I have not. Okay. Okay. Well, I think you made your point. Uh, there was another question uh, uh, over there. <laughs> Can I go home well, now? I am. <laughs> Will all the translators in this room, please, then? No, please, please. Go, go on. Uh. And I find that translating Mm -hmm. So I can agree with Richard Howard that probably good reading is partly translated. I see. I do not agree with my colleague. I see. Yeah. Yes, I think there so was. My question was, but it, it, it was answered already, I think. My question was, I feel like this about uh, cultural interpretation. Why do you not object to being translated? Could you also have curious about it? I don't mean to be flip about this. You know, I think it's really. There, as I was reading the speech, too, it crossed my mind that I'm not ready to say that you can't be accountable to some sort of outside objective thing. And it's, I, I find that I'm, I'm in some sort of uh, strange position of advocating that we can never arrive at an absolute correspondence with this outside thing. 
and yet we still need to strive toward it within the context that, you know, in other words, that there is, there is something, okay, let's not call it translation, let's call it porting over. Something is ported over between a work that was created in one context and the work that's perceived in another context. Steiner's point is even more interesting. He says you can't, like Heraclitus, you can't step in the same stream twice. You can't re read the same text twice and have the, the same effect. Because your context has changed, if by nothing else, by the act of reading that book for the first time. Yeah, so that's what happens when you read a book, for instance, when you're 10, and reread it when right, you're uh, right. 22. Right, right, right. There is, by the way, a very good translation of this particular book of Is there? Done by Peter Bergson. Ah, see. Uh -huh. <laughs> so if you put those two together and compare them. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. All right. What, what's the, the Dutch name? Is it uh, this Achterwabel? I can see the color. Of the Breuzel, uh, yeah. Are there any other uh, questions or people who want to make a point? <laughs> You can ask nice questions too. How is Sal Harm? Yes, I know. I'm sorry. I was just struck by a pre first world war German material and the the choice of location. Mount Mars is a part of the mountain. Right. What kind of research did you do for that mountain? Yeah, um, <laughs> our, it's a very interesting story. Actually, I had um, I had uh, just left graduate school, and I had taken a job as a um, computer programmer. And this, the most wonderful thing about the job, is that uh, it allowed me to read with no eye toward examination no eye toward the, the comprehensive canon, you know, the, the master's reading list. And I read really widely and freely, and uh, uh, seemingly on no, no criterion other than simple pleasure. And I had no idea uh, if, if there was a, a, a connecting theme until the day that I saw this photograph in an exhibition very dramatically, and I realized that I had been reading around a central point. But after that first stage, of course, then came the real Naslach uh, Werk. I mean, then you have to really start digging in and and, uh, and verifying to the best of your ability these uh, these objective uh, um, uh, criteria. And I, I think that uh, I didn't do it as successfully as I, I would like to have done it. And I think that that um, his historical research, I think, is one of those things that's in constant revision. And I think that's actually tantamount to my point. And I made the point about, uh, you know, so-and-so's so -and take on another writer, or this age's take on the meaning of this other age. Our, my, our take on the First World War changed considerably in, in the 30s and 40s. And it changed again, I think, uh, in the 70s and 80s. And I think that the sort of work that you do, when, when, when you do want to ground, it, ground a novel in an historical context, you, you're really uh, tempting fate because 10 years from now you may have a different take on that historical material. <coughs> 10 years from now. Yeah. Well. It's next year. <laughs> I mean, it's well, right. Well, I, I think, for instance, um, the some of the. Textbook has to change uh, every 10 years. Textbook has to change every ten years, at point. least, right? Yeah, I would. Yeah. Well, I mean, for instance, um, I was—I happened to be here in in '89, and it kept going through my head that what we what we what we take in each generation to be the inevitable lessons of history change each time that inevitability changes. You know, uh, as we watch it change. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Um, you talk a lot about the American culture. I mean, you use that term. And I really question if that's uh, what that is. I mean, I right. think somebody from New York City, what they consider American culture is quite different from somebody from yeah. Albuquerque or Biloxi or Absolutely. Miami or... Uh, right. Yeah, good point. And ac actually, when I do when use the term, yeah, right, I, just don't, I think right. it's, uh, it's not a it's not a homogeneity. And I think as I use the term, I hope that in the course of the speech, it became clear that 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 term has has to become ironic. What I was trying to do was was take that apart 
and say they're, they're, they're in, a, in a place like that. And I think I'm, I'm gradually starting to appreciate that, there, that you can't talk about Dutch culture either for the same reasons. And, and that's, that's why I say that, that, that uh, we may not uh, uh, be, be accomplishing a great deal by attempting to our, increase our appreciation of this thing which is so aggregate uh, that, 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 it's, that it's impossible to define in any way that, that uh, would give us a useful definition, that what we really need to do is look at particulars, what I call the specificity, the, the weight of, 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 of uh, the particulars of the world. Yes, perhaps the, the, the tendency to put culture into geographical boundaries, of course, is yeah. outdated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, we were talking about this earlier today. <laughs> is, is Disneyland American? Is it American when it's built in Paris? You know, and what, what do you have in, this, in Paris? You have a castle that's based on a something in Southern California that's based on a sort of fake neo-Gothic monstrosity in, this, in, in, in Bavaria. I mean, <laughs> and now we have one in, in Paris, you know. It's, it's uh, you know, who's responsible for this? in more abstract terms. It's something I think which uh, which you can uh, really put the question uh, at the, of, you know dragging in what what is culture. I don't think anybody can, for instance, grasp a culture outside of a, a geographic uh, uh, area much larger than Holland. I think when you get trying to grasp much larger than Holland or the Netherlands, European. Well, then you're already this becomes so uh, so diverse. Well, it's quite right? even even much. Wasn't the point of the evening to, uh, to, to get a contrast between cultures? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Will you please go about that, sir? <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sure everybody feels free to discuss everything they like. Um, <coughs> I have a question, uh, which I, what would you, because you seem, uh, in a way, I, I would like to talk about non-creative misunderstandings, mm. but you seem very mm. yeah. optimistic yeah. in a sense, you give a lot of examples, but yeah. um, I think some misunderstandings, cultural misunderstandings, I could imagine could be fatal. Yeah, yeah, could have yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean um, which, I th yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but I was thinking of a, a very of a dire example of it. I think perhaps Wagner interpreting yeah. old German legends and then yeah. somebody else in interpreting yeah. Wagner in a strange way. The wrong somebody else, yeah. Yeah. Well, which which brings up this point about are we ready to cut ourselves off from accountability to some ex external moral? And I, I'm not. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess my point is simply that an absolute fit um, is not the only valuable thing that we can come away from, perhaps not reachable, and it should not be a point of despair that we, that, that we, that we have to miss it. I, I, think, I think then you do have to go forward and, and, and begin to develop criteria for distinguishing between a good miss and a bad miss. Mm -hmm. and how you do that, I don't know. I guess it comes back to the particulars again. Mm -hmm. It comes back to the specificity and the particulars, the weight of the things that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But as a creative uh, person, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, where, where, what is your criteria? Where do you draw the line of taking responsibility or not? As I remember a teacher of mine saying that you have total responsibility for the things that you create. Yeah. So, in, to such an extent that it was impossible for so many people to create things because they were so weighed down by that responsibility. Yeah. That's also true. Where Where does the artist's moral sense come from at the moment of creation? To what is the artist accountable as? Well, not at the moment of creation, because that's not in your hands. But after the moment of creation. Yeah, but but wouldn't you agree that it, it it's asking a similar question to? I mean, if if works can be misinterpreted, can we also talk about evil works of art? You know, works works that simply uh, have in them something inimical to 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 what we you know to a trans cultural value. Are there trans cultural values? I guess that's part of the question, isn't it? <coughs> <coughs> Not tonight. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think. I think. What. What. what well. 
We're really talking about whether, or, whether there is a morality that lies outside of the morality as defined by individual cultures. Well, uh, more specifically, your, your, mora- your responsibility as a writer in this case. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, was it Wagner's fault that he allowed himself to be misinterpreted? What was that? What was, the, was there something in Wagner that predisposed yeah. or that made it possible to be yeah. misinterpreted? I don't know. Yeah. And is there something in your books that predisposed the possibility of being misinterpreted, and are you really... I know there, I know there are things in my books that, uh, uh, because, uh, because I, I would say that, that more than anything, when I, when I write, I'm conscious of this, of this, this notion of st- straddling, and many of my books have, as their central device, the idea that in order to get to the heart of something, you need different frames. You need a fictional narrative. You need a bit of mediating on that fictional narrative. You need a memoir. You need a first-person uh, uh, confessional. You need a sort of Rashomon-like building up of takes on something. Uh, so I, I'm particularly conscious of, of, in the act of creation, of straddling different different ways of looking at, at a thing. So I know they must be all all that much more susceptible to 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 a reading different than 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 the one that I would have put together. Is there, yeah? No, another question. Okay. Was, uh, okay. How would you define uh, being understood? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The question. The life or death? <laughs> <laughs> Right now, it's feeling kind of death-like. Um, you know, I, I, I think that there... That, that, that Steiner has something to say about this, too. That there, there is something... There is a kind of tertium quid. If you get three-dimensionality, if I can use this metaphor of the stereoscope, if you get three dimensionality, then you know there is something that's that's worked out that's worked out right. Um, I'm not talking about the feeling of the reader, but of the writer. In in his appraisal of the reader's perception, yeah, I I, I I know that. In other words, if I if I'm putting my ideal image of a book, if I put that ideal, if what if I put what I think I have done in a book next to what a what a reader tells me he or she has found in my books. And if I, if I line those two up and put them in front of my stereoscope and I get three-dimensionality, then I know there is some, some sort of productive uh, difference between those two. Uh, I, it's, that's well, anyway, it's not a question to ask a writer because I don't know any writer who feels understood. <laughs> <laughs> but perhaps you have something more to say on it. You know, I, 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 I think that maybe readers, writers to a certain extent remove themselves from the danger of having to worry too much about how they're being perceived as a sort of self-defense too because if you became too conscious of the differences between perception and, and, and creation it, it, might, it might be overwhelming it might, might prevent you from, from uh, keeping in mind what it was that you were after so maybe the writer isn't the best person to ask that question I don't know Mm-hmm. Yes, please. Uh, what has been the influence of your uh, ability to write computer programs <laughs> on your writing, if any? Quite a bit, especially in the in the third book, my third book. Uh, I think there are even poems that are written in computer language in in the uh, in the third book. You know, programming is a sort of um, structural discipline. It has to work. Um, in fact, it's it's interesting. That's that's that question is very interesting with regard to what we've been talking around up till now. This idea of account, objective accountability. If a program doesn't run, it's no good saying, "Oh, it looks nice." Yeah. Well, look, I, I I find great value in it. <laughs> no, it has to work. And I think that's that kind of structural external accountability that I I like to think that it helps keep you honest when you write fiction. As you look, f- you look for 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 uh, 
ways of organizing your material so that the, the small parts are accountable to the big to the big picture. You know, the subroutines, if you will, have a function within within the, the, the main program. I'm interested in beginnings because I'm a teacher, and um, I wondered if you could just take a few minutes, or maybe ten minutes or something, and tell us um, a little bit about who read to you when you were young, um, what your American school experience was like, mm. both of them, mm. um, who told you you could be a writer early on, and maybe some nurturing later. It's a wonderful question. I just don't know if I can do it justice. I, I, I think it's probably important, but I think, you know, I really think that when you ask a novelist this question, he's going to lie to you, because it's part of the, the story that, that the novelist tells to himself. I see. <laughs> it's It's... It's very interesting, but I, I, I think I am reluctant to get into it just because I feel, I feel as if there must be, there must be so many ways of, of, of getting to a finished book. You know? It, I, I, I thought I would be a scientist. You know, I really did. All the way from my earliest days of growing up in grade school and, and high school and everything. I don't know how I got here. God knows how I'm going to get out. <laughs> well, I like the mystery about it. So, <laughs> um, any other questions? Any remarks? <laughs> any polite remarks? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I thank you all, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did, and I hope Richard Powers enjoyed it. Thanks very much. And thanks to the Institute. Thank you for having come here tonight. We're very glad we could catch you because uh, I now realize it can be unique for quite some time. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad we tried that line on you in the invitation about American culture being underestimated in Europe. It was productive. We, <laughs> we tried it on you and it worked right away. So, I mean, we might try it on other people now. Too. I'll, I'll warn because them. Because we crossed it off, you know, for the next oh, invitations. Yeah. And, but we might put it back in again. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good trip to the United States. Thank, thank you. you very much, Bas Heine, for leading uh, this evening. And uh, our next lecture will be um, the 19th of February. I uh, hope you all enjoyed the evening. Thank you for coming and hope to see you again. Thank you.